What's up? It's good morning from him and from me. It's Thursday, 28th of January. Let's get into it now. What's been going on in the market? And as you can tell, Wall Street bets and the run for cover from hedge funds is the talking point of markets. Definitely the main culprit for the underperformance in US equities yesterday. We had losses ranging from 2 in the Dow to 2.8% in the NASDAQ. It was the biggest S&P 500 route we've had in a couple of months, dating back to October. Um, even in after hours, we continued to move a little bit lower, but that then following on from generally the earnings updates where we had Apple, Tesla, Facebook, all of which traded lower in aftermarket trade. Tesla, the worst of the bunch, down 5%, Apple down uh, over three. But we're going to talk about those in a little bit more detail in a second. But look, in all honesty, look, let's talk about what's been going on in markets. And um, as far as this morning is concerned, um, it's all kind of a little bit picking up from where, where we left off yesterday. So equity index future is a little bit softer uh, this morning. The dollar is a little bit firmer. So the major currency pairs are trading up for the time being. The Dixie up about one tenth of a percent. Uh, oil slight negative, Tino is broadly flat, gold down $11 on the session. Um, yeah, the, the, the main thing I wanted to stress here at the open this morning was that when we're looking at the, um, the general decline in equity markets yesterday, the overall kind of sentiment that was pushing things, definitely it started to pick up when the US started to come in. Uh, and definitely this whole idea about the kind of Wall Street bets uh, and this clash between David and Goliath on the short sellers is, is, is a US generated story because we're talking about US equities here. So a lot of that move really started to get initiated after the close. We also break out of, uh, of the kind of bottom end of the range that we're trading in the spoos over the last couple of sessions. But the point I wanted to make here is that, look, this move was nothing to do with the Fed. Absolutely nothing. The Fed did exactly what was expected. There was no surprises at all. So the move was very much more tied to this idea about not one specific headline as such that, um, that came out yesterday, but a covering of shorts in some of the stocks subject to this kind of new retail activism, if you like, which is forcing a lot of desks to cut their profitable longs elsewhere to cover their, their shorts. And a couple of notes I've made this morning and a few stats but if you're wondering how does short selling work, uh, you know, what's this kind of gamma squeeze and what, how do market makers further fuel the bid in some of these small stocks, then check out the video that I did with Eddie uh, yesterday. He did a really good kind of 10 minute explanation about how all of that works. I'm going to talk about it much more from um, the impact it's had. So Goldman Sachs hedge fund industry VIP ETF um, which tracks hedge funds' most popular stocks, tumbled 4.3% yesterday. It was the worst day since September, and that comes after Monday saw the largest unwinding in equities by hedge funds since August of 2019. Um, interestingly then, one of the main things here is that the most shorted companies in the Russell 3000, so again, as we work our way down this kind of hierarchy of market cap stocks, the S&P 500 being the biggest, then we work it down, the 2000, the 3000, so on, uh, we get down to much smaller size companies. So the most shorted companies in the Russell 3000 have been the index's top performers this year so far. 59 companies in the Russell 3000 rose by more than 10% yesterday, That's even as the index in itself fell um, by around 3%. Um, one of the things that we saw yesterday, it really goes to show just how much of a grip at the moment uh, Wall Street bets, uh, this kind of online community hub uh, on message board on Reddit has over the markets is that moderators of Wall Street bets briefly blocked non-subscribers from accessing their page last night. And uh, the, that caused some of the most discussed stocks to just fall as much as a third before the page turn, returned to its previous status and all of those stock prices rebounded. It's almost like the, the blind leading the blind slightly. And as soon as they talk about stock, it just moves. And, and when they don't, it then 
doesn't move and it reverses that initial spike. Now, the overall kind of summary here, uh, the, the uh, piecing this together of why is it happening? And also, you know, is this type of behavior going to continue today, for example? Well, let's talk about it from a why is it happening point of view. Then we'll look at the S&P chart and we'll, we'll have a look about whether or not this is going to be a persistent thing uh, or are we in for a bit of a rebound. So one of the main reasons why yesterday this move here does look fairly heavy. And I, and I know that at the time it definitely um, did feel that way going through the, the early part of the North American session. But a lot of this, as I've just described, is about hedge funds taking action to reduce their exposure through forced liquidations in certain positions. So one of the things here is that, well, once those liquidations have taken place and those positions have been, uh, let's say, slimmed down, well, then there's no more of that activity to take place at that point. And one of the other things at the moment, I think, is that, you know, given the, the targeted focus of Wall Street bets, this kind of retail mob on some of these bigger short seller hedge funds, then they're just going to steer clear, I would imagine, would be the most prudent course of action until the dust settles. Uh, and then that in itself means that this, this continuous liquid, liquidation kind of move we saw yesterday is probably unlikely to be repeated, uh, at least continuous or to the magnitude of what we saw yesterday. Um, that's, I mean, it's not to say it can't happen again. What I'm saying is that it's not a move that has in, in infinity in the markets where it's just going to go down and down and down and down, I would say. Um, now, why has this happened? Well, the, the, the kind of notation I made to myself was when reading a few articles, uh, I think that this, um, I think this situation is really interesting from a almost a societal level of a reflection of what's going on in the world at the moment because these self-entitled, um, as they would call it, degenerates on these online message boards, we had come at a time where uh, the barrier to entry to stock trading has, has dropped substantially with low cost, um, transactional cost to be able to trade this as well with the sharp growth in stock options trading, which is typically something that in the past has been more um, an area for professionals to trade rather than a retail trader, but does give optionality then literally for having very small um, kind of lottery ticket bets on these type of stocks, looking for like we've had a 1600% gain in a single stock price. Um, but overall, it comes in the context of definitely a deeper rooted issue, which is, I think, a disenchanted youth where, you know, there's difficulty in, you know, labor market conditions, particularly in a pandemic in environment, but coming off of the kind of uh, the gradual recovery through the financial crisis, which has caused quite a um, inflated gap of wealth between you know kind of baby boomer generation to now this generation z and, and millennial the difficulties they confronted with with you know home ownership being so expensive uh, and and these sorts of things so i think there's there's a lot more that's going on uh, as well in the context of you know there's stimulus checks being handed out in the us there's people who are not at work there's people who are locked at home during the pandemic so it's almost like um, all of the ingredients have just come together to form this perfect cocktail that's created this type of movement at the moment. But underlying it, I think, is this um, real kind of activism mentality on the kind of against Main Street or Wall Street in this case. Um, but it's just being played out in a different different way. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Is it going to be long lasting? I don't think so. Um, I think it's just it's just kind of come to this complete um, crescendo moment, uh, which is which was yesterday. Uh, I still think it's going to be a talking point for a little while, but um, I think the world will move on as far as the traditional assets that, that generally that we look at. So, what else is there to actually be aware of that's uh, in focus for markets today? 
Well, look, let's have a quick look at the S&P 500 because it has been um, moving lower, obviously, from, from yesterday's sell-off, inspired by a lot of what we've just been describing. Um, technically speaking, the lows that we had here on the, the 15th of January, that has been a point of now the, the recovery resistance that, that's capped the upside during the Asia-Pacific session before we've drifted back lower. Now, one thing to note is the actual movement over the Fed was pretty benign. The actual deeper movement here came after market um, and perhaps a little bit more pronounced in the lights of the Nasdaq. And that's because we had, you know, when it comes to, to people like Apple, for example, the Apple numbers were pretty spectacular from a corporate earnings perspective. Their EPS, $1.68 against $1.41. Revenues, $111.4 billion obviously breaching 100 billion for the first time and over the expectations of 103 billion. I think their China-based revenues were up around 58%. The iPad, the iPhone, the Mac, the wearables, the services, they all smashed it, basically. Um, but the thing to understand when it comes to corporate earnings season, and particularly a stock like Apple, which is almost like this kind of buy the rumor, sell the fact type of price activity, this is Apple's aftermarket share performance it's down 3.3% effectively. But I think it's important, again, to look at the context because if you actually look at Apple shares then, the aftermarket put them down at around 137, which basically puts them up where they were on Monday. So the stock had been well bid all the way into the release and they basically confirmed what the market believed was going to happen. I mean, it was very well telegraphed in the press that the revenue number, the overall performance given the iPhone 12, given the pandemic situation and the, the impact that has on wearables, home, accessories, services division, we all knew it was going to be good. And so, as I was kind of discussing on the Amplify live stream yesterday, um, the upside relief was going to be minimal at best, if anything, profit taking short term. Definitely Apple, I still think, has a long way to go to the upside. So. I don't, I don't, this doesn't really spook me at all, this kind of pullback. I think it's just a function of the pre, pre-positioning we saw into the earnings. The other companies, I mean, Tesla was down about 5%, you know, some question marks over um, their kind of government credits, reliance, um, the, the payout to Elon Musk for the way that his, his remuneration package is structured because given the meteoric rise of their share price. Um, then Facebook was down about 2%. I mean, when I look at this S&P as a, from a technical perspective, and I stick it on a, on a daily chart, which is this one here, I do think there is a, perhaps a little bit more room for, for, for downside. Uh, I've got marked up here these two rectangles that I've had on this chart for a, for a while. And now that we're below that area, if I just make this a little bit bigger here, this kind of uh, peak of activity that we had at the end of last year, we came back down to briefly test it here and find some support in the middle of January. And as you can see, we broke through that, closed below there yesterday, we've had a false move above there and we remain below that 37.42 here on the daily chart. So that does mean then, I think it does open up a bit of a prospect that a deeper move here, looking at this chart from a technical perspective, 52.50, you know, is it gonna get there today? I don't, I don't think so, but I think it's, gives this, depending on where we close today, I think it gives this market room for perhaps even a, a further pullback. But then, ultimately, I think the normal pattern then resumes where we get up and then we eventually start to move back up. Uh, and, and we do head to all-time highs. So, um, as I said, I think, you know, once hedge funds have readjusted their positions, you know, covering their short bets on the back of this attack from the Wall Street bets, then that's not a long lasting thing that's gonna gonna be around forever and once those positions are adjusted they're adjusted so uh, ultimately then it kind of lands at the feet of this guy Jerome Powell and you know what did he say yesterday well completely as expected um, largely a reiteration of recent commentary near-term uncertainty needed um, to be navigated before a more constructive medium term what he means by that is the constructive medium term is the idea that the vaccine will get rolled out in time into the second half of the year and that will then support the ongoing economic recovery in the US and globally. The near term 
we have to get to that point first, obviously. So that would suggest then that now is not the time to be talking about things like tapering or altering the parameters around their bond buying program. The Fed Chair Powell leaned back against that idea of a premature exit of their kind of accommodative monetary policy at this point, all as expected. So um, all in all then, this in itself, away from that FMC meeting, I do think is one of the reasons that will underpin, even with a pullback, the fact that equity markets will stay relative elevated, if not back to all-time highs at some point in the future. Um, because, again, it's going to be supported by the ongoing assistance, both from a monetary, but also from a fiscal perspective as well, of course, under Joe Biden. Um, a few other talking points to get you up to speed on. The EU remains at loggerheads with AstraZeneca. The drug maker refused to cave into demands uh, to take its vaccine supplies from its UK factories to increase doses going to the bloc in the mainland Europe. Um, they are due to speak again today. So that tip for tat continues to go on. I don't think that headline in itself is something to be spooked about. I think now the market has already digested this idea that the initial numbers of supply uh, of the vaccine in mainland Europe are going to be substantially lower than perhaps was thought just a couple of weeks ago. But that's baked into price now, uh, I would say. I think this needs to be monitored. Uh, a real extreme fallout that causes some sort of protectionism um, reaction in retaliation, uh, I would say, that disrupts then the global um, distribution of vaccines in general obviously would have uh, very disruptive uh, for markets given that that would impede then the economic view about the medium term. So it does need monitoring, but I don't think this headline itself is much of a thing. The German health minister came out just a few minutes ago and said that they will experience at least another 10 weeks of a coronavirus vaccine shortage. Um, so that's the kind of time frames that we're, we're operating with at the moment. Um, Moving as an extension on that, uh, we've had UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson come out uh, and obviously the, the tone has changed already from a few weeks ago, but basically Johnson putting England on notice that the national lockdown will continue for at least another six weeks. Uh, remember, uh, the government was quite hopeful by mid-February and even though the vaccine uh, being administered has gone relatively successfully comparative to peers in the UK, it is slightly off target in terms of that pace. Um, but all in all, just given the situation uh, on the pressure on the infrastructure on the NHS and so on and so forth, um, I think this was very much expected. Uh, if anything, it wouldn't be surprising to see this even roll on further. So again, it's not a market mover, I would say, uh, that's really a focal point for this morning. That then leads us on for what have we got today? Well, we've had a couple of the first German state CPIs come out already. Uh, again, I don't think they're, they're going to be massive. The month-to-month -month Saxony figures already come out 0.5%. Uh, that was the same as previous. Uh, I wouldn't be really looking for that to initiate real firm direction in European assets. Um, the sentiment figures that here for the Eurozone, uh, for any new trader, these look quite interesting. You know, economic sentiment, industrial sentiment, service sentiment, um, but they very rarely move the market. So again, uh, I wouldn't kind of be sitting on your hands if you see an opportunity. I don't think you need to be particularly cautious around the timing of those numbers. Um, the main kind of figure from a, from a schedule perspective is the Q4 advanced US GDP figure. Um, it's expected to obviously decelerate sharply from the huge bounce that we saw uh, from the previous study's 3.4% down to uh, a 4% figure. We do have uh, a wide range. Remember, this is the advanced figure, so it does carry the propensity to move markets the most out of the advanced preliminary and final readings. And the range then is much wider this time round because it's a kind of g a modelled, generated expectation of what the GDP headline of 4% is from all these different banks and uh, research houses. So the range is 0 to 6.8%. Um, even if it goes either way. I don't think it's a particularly big deal for the Fed. So beyond the intraday, I don't think it's too important. But from the intraday perspective, sure, a breach of either side could be interesting. Um, how to take it? Well, I guess if we get a, a, a negative print 
which is considerably weaker obviously than four percent growth and the lower bound of of zero you'd probably be thinking then well look there's no way that the fed are going to have any of this exit talk about their their policy at the moment so um t notes would probably be bid the dollar would weaken if anything uh, equities could be supported by this idea that you know there's no need to fret about the, the tightening of policy anytime soon so that's how I'd kind of interpret that. But that's coming up 1.30, will be one of the main focal points of the session ahead. You've also got the core PCE figure, the initial jobless claims all coming out at the same time. Jobless claims expected at 875,000 from the prior 900 we saw last week. New home sales then follows at three, but I'd say the 1.30 group of data is much more important, um, as will too be the open on Wall Street to see whether or not then is there any more further unwinding of some of these short bets by these hedge funds? But one would think they've been pretty active already over the course of the last few days to try and uh, run for cover. And so if that is the case, and then you get a GDP number, which perhaps hits a bit of a sweet spot where it's not fantastically strong, it's kind of okay, moderate growth, let's say, which allows the Fed to remain fairly loose in its policy. And then the market starts to recover uh, inevitably because from those earnings reports like Tesla or Apple, I really don't think that really they were bad reports. It's just a function of just how their share price has been reacting ever since the last you know, last few months. Um, earnings for today, you've got probably McDonald's pre-market is one of the main ones to look out for. Visa, uh, the airline, American Airlines, uh, MasterCard few other names but McDonald's probably the visa the, the larger cap ones to be aware of and then you've got a seven year note auction coming out for any US fixed income traders all right that is it going to leave it at that um, any comments at all feel free to, to just leave a comment I'm happy to respond uh, if you're watching this on YouTube remember to like and subscribe really appreciate it and remember to check out Eddie's video as well on the channel definitely worth a watch on what's been happening with GameStop and explaining it um, with much greater detail. Thanks very much guys, have a good day ahead.